And other prominent world leaders are making their UN speeches, including U.S. President Joe Biden. While calling out North Korea for its relentless violations of UN Security Council resolutions, he still left some room for diplomacy. For more, we're joined by Professor Han Shuttle this morning. It's good to have you with us. Good morning, Dami. Nice to see you as well. You know, the Biden's comment calling out uh, condemning North Korea for its military provocations, but also showing dedication to diplomacy as a means of achieving denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. Do you think this is a surprising comment, is it? I think it, Biden was very measured and predictable at the UN, Dami, as you suggested. He did sound the alarm bells, the appropriate alarm bells, about North Korea's violation of UN Security Council resolutions. At the same time, uh, he was extending an open door to diplomacy, and that's typically the status quo in the state of affairs. I don't think it necessarily means that diplomacy will soon be happening as a result. We can certainly hope for that. But at the same time, I think the U.S. does have to raise concerns. And, of course, South Korea will be raising concerns when President Yoon speaks as well about the uh, ongoing exchanges now and potential collaboration between uh, North Korea and Russia. Um, Biden's China comments were also very interesting, I thought, Dami. I thought the president was rather conciliatory considering the state of affairs with China. And I noticed he echoed his comments at the G7 summit in May about the world economy and its key players de-risking rather than coupling from China. And he also emphasized a willingness to work with China to try to address um, global problems better. So it seemed to me akin to a suggestion that China might come back. He's trying to convince China to come back to, say, the G20 forum. The next time it meets, having, uh, of course, China skipped the G20 summit in India earlier this year. And I, again, I would say he was less conciliatory on the war in Ukraine. He certainly was um, placing the blame for that on Russia and reiterating. Uh, U.S. support. I think we'll see many democracies. Right. Speaking of Ukraine, you know, I have to mention Ukraine's a leader making his speech there for the first time since Russia's aggression against uh, the war-torn country began last February. Now, does his message, Zelensky's message, align with Biden's? Yes, definitely. And I think President Zelensky's uh, speech was maybe the showstopper so far at the United Nations. One of the headlines in the Associated Press coverage of President Zelensky's speech really said it all, that Russia has turned food, energy, and even children mm. into weapons against Ukraine. And Zelensky's point there is that civilians, that everyday people in Ukraine, people just going about their lives, are the ones who have been bearing the heaviest brunt of this war. And I thought it was also very important that President Zelensky reminded the world that tens of thousands of children, we don't really know how many children, maybe even hundreds of thousands of children since Russia first occupied parts of East Ukraine in 2014, have been kidnapped and forcibly taken from the, the Ukrainian-controlled parts of Ukraine into Russian-controlled areas, even Russia itself, perhaps. And this should be a major concern to the United Nations member states. So Zelensky compared it to genocide. And even though these children are not being killed, it seems that Russia is apparently making a concerted effort here to try to exterminate the Ukrainian identity of these children. And this is actually one of the key issues that's in the arrest warrant that's been issued for Vladimir Putin, the Russian leader, by the International Criminal Court. So I thought it was very appropriate that we hear more about it at the U.N. summit. Definitely. It's just day two. Now, President Yoon is yet to deliver his speech at the uh, U.N. General Assembly. He is widely expected to, you know, call out on uh, Pyongyang and Moscow for their military collaboration. Uh, how will that warning uh, make any significance at the annual gathering? Well, I think it might be very similar, Dami, to what we saw in Seoul earlier this week. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as I think you know, called in the Russian ambassador to South Korea to express concern over Russia's discussions with North Korea on arms trading and also military cooperation. Obviously, the concern here, and I think many countries at the UN summit will be worried about it, is the possibility that North Korea provides Russia with arms, while at the same time, Russia perhaps provides some know-how that it um, helps North Korea go even further in its nuclear weapons and 
missile programs, even satellite technology using ballistic missile technology as well. And all that's prohibited by a series of UN Security Council resolutions. So many members of the UN will frown upon that kind of behavior, especially considering that Russia is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. But again, Russia's behavior in Ukraine also raises concern along these areas. So maybe that permanent membership status is actually something worth discussing as well, but that will be hard to change, I think. That's a very good point, Professor Hans. Now, UN's itinerary in New York also includes attendance at a digital forum at uh, NYU. And there, he'll unveil plans to announce the so-called Digital Bill of Rights, which will you know, draw details of a new digital order. Why do you think he's delivering a speech on such topic? This is an ongoing interest of President Yoon's, and I think it's also a growing interest for many world leaders because, of course, we all know that digital technology has outpaced our capacity collectively as societies to deal with it. So there are all kinds of problems um, these days regarding intellectual property rights and also incivility online, um, surveillance issues that go with digital technology, monopoly power on the part of corporations. So there is a need in a sense, I think, for governments and citizens to try to figure out how to better manage our new digital universe to promote better quality of life for everyone. So any conversation in this regard is an important thing, especially in a country like South Korea, I think, where you know the digital universe is so ubiquitous. So you know, many, many leaders in government, academia, and beyond are concerned about this. And President Yoon is certainly joining the conversation. All right. Thank you, Professor Hans, so much for your insight this morning. You have a good day. You too, Dami. Thank you.